Good morning, church. I hope you all brought your packed lunches because we're going to be here a while. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but, you know, I hope you all are hungry for the word of God this morning. You know, the devil, he wants people to think that he doesn't exist. He wants people to live their life ignorant as long as they can and die apart from God. Now, there's this quote that if God does not exist then everything is permissible. I want you to think about that. If God does not exist, then everything is permissible. What does that mean? That means that uh, if there's no objective truth for where right and wrong really come from, then whatever your truth is, is what is right. And if my truth is what is right, and it goes against your truth, what is right, then we're both right, but that doesn't make any sense. You know, when you think about what truth really is it really is the origin of truth can only come from our creator in heaven god you know a lot of uh, college campuses these days are full of those who like to emphasize you can follow your truth whatever is true for you you follow your truth but if god does not exist then everything is permissible you know there was a lot of people back in the 1940s 1930s and 40s that their truth was that uh, all those who were, who were against the, the, the Nazi Germany, their truth was that we should exterminate them and conquer them. But is that right or wrong? The answer is that we know that there is a right and wrong. We know that there is a right and wrong lawgiver, and that comes from God. And it doesn't come from what my opinion is. It doesn't come from what my truth is. Rather, it comes from God. See, Satan's greatest success is making people think that they have plenty of time before they die to consider their eternal welfare. Have you guys ever uh, heard of frogs? I've heard of frogs. I know uh, some people who visited Paris have heard of frogs, especially those frog legs. Amen, Brandon? I don't know if he's eaten frog legs before. But if you're going to cook a frog, they take alive frogs, they put them in cold water, and the frogs are cold-blooded, so they kind of adjust their temperature to whatever their surrounding environment is. And so as it, they turn on the heat, the frogs adjust little by little, and they don't realize they're in danger until they're boiled alive. They don't realize they're in danger until they're boiled alive. But if you're warm-blooded, you start to feel the heat, and you're like, I need to get out of here, and you jump out. My question for you this morning is, are you cold-blooded? adapting to what the world is doing or are you warm-blooded on fire for god oh, okay. let's turn to ephesians chapter 6 because we can't be unaware of satan's schemes last week we talked about fighting the good fight of faith yeah. and we have to remember that we don't live in just a physical realm but there is a spiritual battle happening every single day and we believe that God is working for our good, but Satan is also equally working for our destruction. He's constantly going to be throwing flaming darts and arrows at us, getting us to be impure, getting us to be faithless, and to turn our backs on God. But today, we're going to be talking about the strategy of Satan, and we're following the series that our great uh, uh, brother Andrew Smelly is preaching in the, in the D.C. church. We're going to be unified in the lessons we're doing. But, uh, but we're going to be talking about the series of the strategy of Satan, and we're going to be looking at a few different people in the scriptures, but today's point, as we look at Eve in the scriptures, we're going to be looking in Genesis 2 and 3 today, but as we look at Eve, we're going to be learning how to defend ourselves against one of Satan's schemes, which is to attack us in our minds. Our title for the lesson this morning is Satan the Deceiver. Let's go to Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, the scripture reminds us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but, you know, isn't that the easiest thing to fight against? Man, that person is, is, is a jerk. Right? That person treated me a certain kind of way. That sister looked at me funny. You know, that brother, you know, he, he, he's intimidating to me and he's trying to show off or something. You know, Satan tries to get in our mind, make it all about the people in front of us. Man, that scripture that you showed me, that was offensive because you're mean. It's like, wait a second. 
There's a, there's a spiritual battle happening, and the scripture says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. God wants us to remember that the spiritual battle is a spiritual battle. But Satan does work through people, so we can't, we can't be uh, deceived about his schemes. There's powers in this dark world. And if you're visiting today, maybe you believe in the devil. Maybe you don't believe in the devil, but whether or not you believe in him doesn't change his agenda of what he's doing in your life. Evil really exists, and we see evil in the world, and it's God who determines what evil is. Let's look at uh, John chapter 13, verse 26. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times we can think like, oh man, the devil ain't getting to me. The devil ain't going to get to me. I am blessed. I am anointed. I am sanctified. The devil ain't getting to me. But you know what? We're going to look at John 13. Judas thought the same exact thing. I don't know if you guys heard of Judas, but he's the guy that betrayed Jesus. John 13, verse 26. And I hope you brought a Bible this morning or you're reading the scriptures along with us because we are a Bible church. We're going to look at God's word this morning. John 13, verse 26. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have it dipped in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. I think a good question is, how did we take communion this morning? This is the Lord's Supper that they were taking here. And Judas took the bread from Jesus, and as he took the bread, he took it in an unworthy manner, and Satan actually entered into him. We can allow Satan to enter into us if we have unresolved conflict or issues with people in our hearts. And the question is, because we know we're all sinners, right? Everyone always agrees, oh yeah, we're all sinners, right? But sometimes we can say that and not really be in touch with my own sin. Oh yeah, we're all sinners. Hey, hey, did you see that you fell short in this way? Yeah, but we're all sinners, like as a defense mechanism. No, but we're all sinners. That's why I did that, okay? But when we take communion, we get to really connect in our own hearts to our relationship with God. When we take communion, it's like having a spiritual shower, like man. I get to have my sins forgiven because of my relationship with God. And if we're taking communion in a righteous way, then there should be no issues. We have to examine ourselves. It says that in 1 Corinthians that we examine ourselves when we take communion. I hope you took communion in a worthy manner this morning. But something we have to realize is that Satan has an agenda and he's coming for us. And we can't be unaware of Satan's schemes. And just like Judas, Satan entered into him. We have to be on the lookout for Satan entering into us. But it's pretty awesome that when we have the power of God as a Christian, Satan can't penetrate the spiritual armor of God. And because Satan knows this, because when you, when you have a battle, right, in, in any uh, historical battle, if there's a smaller army going against this larger army, the only way that people can win is if they get in the heads of the bigger army and figure a way to get them all confused and duped, right? Uh, I mean, you can look at battles like... Uh, Napoleon was a great strategist at this. He was able to divide people up and then get, even though he had a, less, a weaker force, he was able to still conquer, which is pretty crazy, because of mind games. Now, Satan knows the exact same thing. He knows that if you have your armor on, he cannot penetrate that. So what does he do? He plays mind games. He's a deceiver. And we're, we're going to be looking at some scriptures today and over the next few weeks going over some lessons about Satan's schemes and his agenda. Today is Satan the deceiver. But instead of having point number one, point number two, like we normally do, we're looking at four things. The first thing is the target. How is Satan going to target you? The second thing is what are the weapons he uses? The third is the goal of what Satan's goal is. What is he trying to accomplish? And number four, what is your defense? How are you going to stand against it? So our first point this morning is Satan's target. In this case, what is Satan's target? It's your mind. Satan wants to come for your mind. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Remember the title this morning, Satan the Deceiver. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. He wants to get inside your mind. Mm -hmm. Genesis 3, verse 1. Oh, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. 
You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. You know, what's kind of funny is people always say, man, if Eve didn't eat that fruit, we would have had a much better life. If Eve hadn't done that, we would have been much better off, right? I don't know if you guys have heard that before. But, you know, look, look, you know, and, and people say, yeah, that's just wicked. Eve was so wicked. But here's the thing. Adam was there the whole time. It says Adam was with her, ate it. He was with her. I mean, I don't know about you guys who are in the marriage ministry. As a, as a husband, let, letting your wife talk to a serpent is what kind of watch it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's normal. <laughs> but Adam was with her. So, so we, don't, we can't just blame Eve. Adam was the one who's really to blame here. Mm. Lack of spiritual leadership in his household. Yeah. Mm. Men need to stand up and be spiritual leaders. Amen? Amen? But let's read verse 7. After they ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. See, say, Satan is pretty crafty. He's pretty crafty. I mean, what was his target when he came after Eve? He wanted to get inside her head. He wanted to get inside her mind. Because our mind is what can really grasp and truly understand the knowledge of God. And if he can mess up your mind and how you think, you start to see things differently. And, you know, it's possible for us to read the Bible. I don't know about you guys. But it's possible to read the Bible and still not really understand what the Bible is trying to say to you. Because your mind is not in the right place. You can read but not really see it because your spiritual vision is blocked. How you think matters. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Oh, no. Ephesians 4 verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. Come on. Paul writes to Ephesus. He says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer... Ephesians 4, 17, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now, when he's referring to Gentiles, he's referring to those who are basically non-believers. There's the way that the world operates and the world that true disciples of Jesus operate. He's saying, look, don't live as the world lives anymore. You can't do that anymore. And it's, they live in this way in futility of their thinking. In verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. You know that word sensuality, what it basically means is you're all in your feelings. You're all up in your feelings. What does that mean? Well, your feelings become your truth. Whatever feels right for me is what needs to happen. I feel a certain kind of way and therefore I'm going to follow how I feel. Feelings is Lord. Jesus is not Lord. Feelings is Lord. That could be emotionally, but that also includes whatever feels good right now, do it. If it feels good, do it. You know, I feel hurt. I'm going to hold on to my bitterness because of how hurt I feel towards this person. When Jesus says, forgive your brother from your heart. I feel like that girl's real good looking. I want to be immoral, right? But Jesus says, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. We can feel all sorts of things. And that's actually what the scripture says is that's the world's mindset is living how you feel. And that's where we get nonsense such as your truth. Truth is not yours and truth is not mine. It is truth. But sensuality, when you give yourself over to what you feel, it says you indulge in every kind of impurity and you're full of greed, which basically means you never have enough. Verse 20. 
That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. You know what's pretty powerful is, is, is this is not the life that we learn when we become true disciples of Jesus. And if there's never been a point in time in your life that you can say, you know what, I was taught to put off that old way of thinking, and I put on my new way of thinking at that point in time, it's time to learn. It's time to be taught. And you know what it says? You were taught. I didn't naturally have the inclination to be a disciple of Jesus. I was not born as a, yep, I'm a follower of Jesus. No, that's a decision you make at some point in your adult life. I want to follow Jesus and never look back. You were taught to put off your old way of life and be made new in the attitude of your minds. See, our mind is so important. How we think matters. And you know, going back to Genesis, we'll go back there in a little bit. Once Satan can get you to believe a lie, then he can lead you into any sort of sin. When you subscribe to the lies that the world has to offer, he will get you to follow into any kind of sin. And you know what's deceitful about it is we... we tell ourselves why it's okay to commit these sins. You know, when I was uh, in eight, uh, 17, 18 years old, I was dating my high school girlfriend, my senior year of high school. I knew what was right and I knew what was wrong. I had no excuse. I was raised in a, in a religious household. I knew a lot of the scriptures. I knew of scriptures that talked about impurity, immorality, all these things. But I told myself, well, if we get married someday, it'll be all right. If we get married in the future someday, it'll be all right to cross boundaries of impurity and immorality. And unfortunately, that's what I did because I allowed Satan to enter in me because I had no defense. I wanted whatever I felt like. I loved her more than anything. And because of that, I was willing to compromise every area of my life to follow what I felt. That's the way of the world. But Satan gets in our minds and he gets us to think, well, I deserve this. It's something I want. And that's what sin really is. It's kind of an entitlement to having things our way. But we are called to think about whatever is true using our mind, right? Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. See, we're called to keep our mind set on things above. You know, iron, there's a quote that none can destroy iron only its own rust. <laughs> Nothing can destroy iron, only its own rust. Likewise, none can destroy a person, but only his own mindset. If Satan can look through the cracks, because remember, you got the spiritual armor on, you're set. You're set, but Satan knows he can't get over that, so what's he going to do? He's going to try to find a crack and throw a little dart right through that crack and get into your mind. And if he can get in your mind, then it's you who drops your armor and accepts the full assault from Satan. Wow. Many wars were fought with tactics of the mind, like I said. And uh, we have to be on guard from Satan's attack. Now, Satan, that's, his, that's his, uh, his goal, right? That's what he wants to get, is your mind. That's his objective. Now, what weapons does he use? What weapons does the devil use to get in your mind? He uses lies. Yeah. Let's look at how Eve believed this lie in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He said, Did God really say this? You mustn't eat from any tree in the garden? You know what's interesting about Satan? He didn't say, God didn't say anything to you. He didn't say that. He said, he didn't deny that God had spoken. What did he do? He just questioned, did God say what he really meant, do you think? You think that's what he really meant when he said that? And now, what is he doing? Planting a little seed of doubt in Eve's mind. Then, he kind of gets her moving forward in that line of thinking and gets her to question the love and the goodness of God. Look at verse 5. It says, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, he's saying like, hey, God knows if you eat this, you're going to kind of be like God. So, of course, he doesn't want you to eat that. He's holding out on you. 
He's holding out on you. You know, that's what sin kind of deceives us. Like, you know, man, I didn't get what I want when I want, so maybe God isn't that good. If God doesn't give me what I want, and why is my life so hard right now? Maybe God isn't that good anyway. Maybe that's a good reason to disobey. But if God loves you, then why is he holding out the special knowledge from you? That's basically what the devil's saying to Eve. If God loves you so much, why is he holding out on the special knowledge? Why shouldn't you be able to eat of this tree? And he also tells her, then he starts to deny God's word as well. In verse 4, he also says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. See, if we can question God's word, did God really say this? Then we can start to doubt God's intentions and we can fully make a decision. You know what? I'm just going to deny that. See, all Adam and Eve had to go on was the word of God. If Eve hadn't listened to the questioning of God's word, then she wouldn't have had to fall for any sort of trap. If Satan tried to come up and start talking to her, she's like, why am I even listening to this? How is this going to help me at all? spiritually then she wouldn't have fallen for the trap but you know adam and eve were already made in the image of god and what was the promise that satan told them if you eat this you'll be like god knowing good and evil isn't that what people want today they want to be like god Mm -hmm. i want what i want i want to get what i want i'm going to work to get what i want and once i get what i want it's never enough and i need more i need more You guys ever seen Bruce Almighty, that old movie with Jim Carrey? He's like walking down the street, and that song, I got the power. Walking down the street, and you you know, and he's like, and then like the the fire hydrant goes up, and he's driving, and he's like does this, and all the cars move out of the way. I wish I could do that once in a while, but you know, we can want to be like God by following Satan's schemes. And you know, the crazy thing about Satan is that Satan, as a fallen angel, is pretty handsome. He looks kind of good. In fact, we we just had Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. People think Satan looks like the devil. I mean, I went to Arizona State University. Their mascot is the sun devil. I know it's pretty ironic, right? We went to Arizona State University. Sydney and I both did. Their mascot is the sun devil. And so I I never really felt right about saying, yeah, go devils. It just wasn't really a thing. But, but, But I mean, you know, the devil doesn't look like the dude with the pitchfork and the horns. If that's what the devil looked like, then it would be easy to point it out and say, oh, there's the guy right there. There's that evil guy. In fact, no, Satan looks like everything you ever wanted. That's what the devil looks like to you. Satan has the power to give you these things. And we'll talk more about that later. But Eve, listening to Satan's attack, how did she respond to Satan's approach? She thought about God's word, but she kind of misremembered it or misinterpreted it. Let's look at Genesis 2, the original thing that God said to her. Genesis 2, verse 16. Genesis 2, verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. See, what does he say? You, you can't eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. You're free to eat any tree in the garden, but you cannot eat from this one because when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, when she, when Eve remembers what God said in chapter three, verse two, the woman says to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. God never said you can't touch it. I mean, is it a good idea to touch the forbidden fruit? Probably not a good idea. But that's not exactly what God said. He just said you can't eat it. So sometimes when we are thinking about God's commands, we we take it in such a way where it's like, oh, we can't even touch it. And, you know, and it's like we kind of make it seem like it really is worse than it is. See, God's commands in our life are not burdensome. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, come follow me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Actually, following Jesus is the best life you could ever choose to live for yourself. But when you start to question God's goodness and his grace and his intentions, it becomes harder and harder to obey. See, she she started to doubt because what what was she feeling? God's holding out on me. If if God is so good, why is this? Why am I not getting this thing when I want it? You start to question God's goodness, his grace, and his intentions, it's harder to obey. 
And then our relationship with God, instead of being a close, intimate relationship, becomes one more out of duty. Say, man, I gotta, and there's, there's no motivation to do it out of love. Rather, it becomes less and less of a desire and more of a duty that I have to do. And when marriages even get that way, you know it's headed in the wrong direction. When, when the husband and the wife don't even communicate with each other and talk with each other anymore the way they used to, and it's like, well, I'm doing my duty. Why aren't you doing your duty? There, the love is losing. But one thing she took away from God's word is that you are free, but then she added to the word of God right there. In verse 3, God says, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. But if we remember what God says in verse 17 of chapter 2, he says, When you eat from it, you will certainly die. So she even kind of changed God's word there again. When, when God says, You will certainly die, and then when remembering it, it's like, Oh, you will die. Sometimes in our mind, we can kind of devalue what the consequences of disobedience will be it's like oh well what's going to really happen if i get into the sin right now well i can ask for forgiveness later not a big deal but we kind of forget like hey if i continue down this path the only result end result of this is death yeah. and even every single one of us is it true that you can repent after you sin yeah that's what grace is about mm -hmm. but is it really repentance if i willingly go into it with the expectation of asking for forgiveness later People always misunderstand that. They say, Christianity, it's like I stole the bike and then asked for forgiveness later. You guys heard that? Where it's like, I wanted a bike, so I prayed for a bike. But I know God doesn't work that way, so I stole one and asked for forgiveness later. Right? People have this idea of what Christianity is about. But if you go into sin willingly, you never know when is the last time you're going to be able to commit that sin and live. Because God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. The strategy of Satan is to get us to doubt God's word, and he's coming for our mind, and he wants to tell us lies. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26, Paul writes, you don't have to turn there, but Paul writes about a thing called false believers. He talks about him being under attack by false believers. There is a false Christianity out there. There's a false Christianity propagating that you can do whatever you want when you feel like Jesus will always forgive you, and not only are there false Christians, there's false counterfeit ministers who are preaching this kind of gospel. And there's counterfeit ministers who lead these whole counterfeit churches with counterfeit righteousness. Isn't it Satan's goal? If I, if I had this life-saving cookie, right, and I wanted to give it to everybody and say, this cookie is awesome. If you eat this, it'll cure cancer. Well, wouldn't it be a pretty good cookie? Yeah. What is Satan going to do? He can't stop me from selling the cookie, but he's going to create 50 other cookie stands that are all poison and get people to like think that cookies are bad. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Satan wants us to believe in a false gospel, and he's working to delude people. And his weapons are lies. Now, what is his goal, ultimately, to make us ignorant of God's will? His target, what's his target? Our mind. Our mind. Yeah. What is his weapon? Lies. He's throwing lies at us. And what is his goal? He wants to make us ignorant of God's will in our life. See, Satan's goal is to get you to never read your Bible or pick it up. That's Satan's goal. If he can get you to uh, stay up late, even if you're just playing video games or whatever, staying up late and the next morning you never wake up and read your Bible, he's winning. Because you're not putting on your armor. But we are a Bible church and we can't be ignorant of God's word. But it's not enough just to know about it. you got to love the truth. Just because I know the truth doesn't mean I'm obeying it. If I know the truth, I really know it when I'm obeying it. Amen? What's God's will? Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Hey, this is one you can memorize. You want to know how? It's the 1, 2, 3, 4 scripture right there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. What's God's will? Just count to 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. See, if God's goal is to get us to come to a true knowledge of the truth 
it, we can only assume that Satan's goal is the exact opposite of God's goal. Yeah. Satan wants you to be ignorant of the truth, but God wants you to know the truth. You know, if we aren't teaching others the word of God, if we're not getting in other people's lives, helping them have a relationship with God, then we're actually acting as agents of Satan because we're not doing anything to fight against the devil. Wow. You know, we could say, well, I'm not acting as an agent of Satan. I go to church, I read my Bible, I do all this stuff, and maybe I'm a good person, but, you know, something to keep in mind is that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Why? There were millions of bystanders when Nazi Germany came to power in 1940, 1930s and 40s, right? And millions of, of bystanding people who watched all these atrocities happen. See, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. That's all it takes. For evil to prevail on our campuses, for evil to prevail in our workplaces, to prevail in the state of Delaware, is for us to do nothing. But we can be doing God's will by actively teaching other people God's will as well. We can be part of the solution. See, when you share your faith with someone, you're part of the solution. You're becoming a teacher of men. You know, when we know the truth, we got to share it with people. We have to share it. That's sharing that cookie with people. It's the cancer-saving cookie. Having a relationship with God. We become educators of God's word. And we got to teach the word properly. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We have to know, because that's God's will, right? Ultimately, yeah. the goal of God is to help us know God's will, but Satan's goal is to get you to be ignorant of God's will. The question is, what is stopping you from really knowing God's will this morning? What's getting in the way? Now, when Satan attacks with his lies, he attacks our mind with his lies, with the goal in mind of trying to make us ignorant of God's will and to let go of it, we got to know how to defend ourselves, and that's our fourth point, is the defense. Our defense. And we're going to look at Jesus' example in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I bet he was, after 40 days and 40 nights. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. See, the same strategy Satan used with Eve, he, he tries to do with Jesus. Satan is not like he... We know his game plan. We can know his schemes. We know how he works because we have the Word of God. But Satan is consistent. In fact, he's more consistent than you are. Satan is consistently doing the same thing, just waiting for the opportune time when you let your armor down and you're not paying attention and Satan's going to throw a dart at you and get you. But luckily, Jesus shows us how he responds here. He says, if you're the son of God, get these stones to become bread. I bet that would have been tempting. Like, yeah, you know what? I do have the power to turn these stones into bread. And I, you know what? I am pretty hungry. Yeah. And I bet it was even, you know, vegan. Like, like high quality, organic, vegan. Like, I bet it was good. You know what I mean? And I bet it was full of gluten. Amen? But... Verse 4. Verse 4. Jesus answers, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, the only proper response when Satan tries to throw darts at you is to remember what is true. It is written. He didn't say, Well, I feel like that's not the right thing to do. Here's what I feel. You know how you feel it goes up and down like this? If you're anything like me, it goes up and down like this. Sydney knows. You can ask her later. But it wasn't Jesus' opinion. Well, I think my opinion is I probably shouldn't do that, you know. Or, you know. But no, what did he say? It is written. And yet we try to go through our life trying to uh, combat Satan's schemes by how we feel in the moment. If you go by your feelings, you're already done for. You're already done for. The word of God is the sword of truth. That's the sword of the spirit, which is truth. You have to go by the word. Jesus says, it is written. Now the devil tries another attack. Verse 5. The devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Interesting. It's kind of like, you know, Satan's like, 
trying to come after him a little bit, like, there you go. And Jesus is like, ah, you know, yeah. using the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. A little sparring match. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Isn't it interesting that now that Jesus introduced scripture to the sparring match, what did Satan do? He came back with a scripture. Oh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's like, hey, you know what? Satan's schemes can involve misinterpreting scripture and getting you to follow a false path. Wow. All you need to do is say Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. That's it. Don't read anything else. Don't do anything else. Just say that and believe that in your heart. And you're good. Whatever you do between this Sunday to next Sunday when you come crying and repenting, don't worry about that. Just say Jesus is Lord. You're all good. Interesting. It's a sparring match. Jesus says don't put the Lord your God to the test. You've got to look at things in context with the rest of Scripture. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. I mean, he probably looked pretty handsome. Like I was saying, the devil is a pretty handsome guy. Pretty handsome guy with a fallen angel. And here he is saying, look, Jesus, if you just follow and worship me, I'll give you all these things. Isn't it interesting that Satan has authority over all the world? Isn't that pretty interesting? And he even has the audacity to tell Jesus, I will give this to you. Jesus is like, I created this. But still, he wouldn't have tried to tempt Jesus that way if it wasn't something he could have done. He said, all this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. See, Jesus remembers it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And by doing that, Jesus knew the path he was going to go down. One of total surrender and obedience to God, but one that wasn't the most comfortable. The most comfortable way is not always the right way. The most comfortable way is the way that feels good now. Whatever feels good, do it. We can't go by our feelings. We have to go by the word of God. And I'm grateful that Jesus went by God's will because of that. I have a chance to have eternal life with him because of him suffering and dying on the cross for me. Our defense is we have to, number one, know the truth. you got to know what the scripture says. If you don't know what the Bible says, you're already losing the battle. Mm -hmm. You're already losing the battle. you got to know the truth. you got to know. You can know the Bible but still be ignorant. You only really know it if you hold to the teachings and implement it in your life. Mm -hmm. you got to be trained to know what the truth is in the word of God. There's elementary truths. And when you actually, you know what's pretty awesome? Somebody who doesn't know anything about Jesus. I appreciate our brother, uh, Jeffrey. Oh, no. Jeffrey, a PhD student from China. Yeah. Wow. Barely knew anything about Jesus. In a matter of a month or two, made Jesus Lord of his life, was baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. Yeah, awesome. And he, could, he has more wisdom about what it means to follow Jesus than some of the most knowledgeable scholars of God's word. You don't want to know why? Because he's putting it into practice. Because he's putting it into practice. It's time for you to learn how to put into practice God's elementary teachings in your life. Mm -hmm. we got to be teachers of God's word. And once you put it into practice, you're qualified to teach it to somebody else. Isn't that pretty awesome? Yeah. And because we know the truth, not only that, we have to memorize God's word. Something I appreciate about Jesus, he didn't say, oh, Satan's coming after me. Oh, where's my Bible? Oh. <laughs> where, where is it? <laughs> he didn't run for his Bible. Why? Because it was in here. And it was in here. He memorized God's word. He quoted scriptures from Deuteronomy. He knew exactly which scripture to use to defend Satan's schemes. Why? Because he knew Satan was going to come after him at some point. See, if you don't think Satan's ever going to come for you, you're going to lose the battle when the battle happens. It's going to be over before you even know it. Yeah. So you've got to put on your armor. You've got to know where your weaknesses are and fight the battle using the word of God. You've got to have memory scriptures on your heart. There's a great one for purity. It's in Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. In verse 11, I have hidden the word of God in my heart so that I don't sin against God. If you want to not sin against God, you got to get the word of God in your heart. Mm -hmm. It's so simple. But God's word is so powerful. If we know the lyrics of our favorite songs more than we know scriptures that are going to help guard our hearts, we got to do a little bit of a, a 
looking in the mirror right there. I bet some of us could recite some uh, pretty vulgar rap songs that we heard in the past more, more than we know the word of God. I mean, let's be real. Satan, actually it's said, some people believe that Satan was like a chief song leader in heaven. Isn't it interesting that Satan probably uses the mediums of music to get what's in your heart? But we can sing to God with all of our heart. The Psalms are songs, right? You can read those, memorize Psalms, and pray to God using your heart. You got to be careful what you're listening to, fellas. You got to be careful what you're listening to, because wherever your heart is, whatever you're thinking about, that's the direction you're going to go. We have to hide the word of God in our hearts and never let go of that honeymoon phase with God. It's like, man, I, when I got baptized for the forgiveness of my sins, I came up out of the water. I was so fired up. You know how much I had in my bank account? Probably like 100 bucks. I don't even care. I don't even care. I came out of the water. I was so fired up. And you know what? Later that month, I got pink eye and a, and a root canal. So I'm like, and I'm walking down the street just praying. I'm like, God, I'm grateful. And I came to, to campus devotional on a Friday night, and I remember sitting there on the couch. I'm like, man, my eye's really itchy, and I, and I have my eye closed the whole time. So people are like, what's up with Nelson? I'm like, hey, guys. But I just remember feeling so grateful. Why? Because my sins were forgiven. Because I have a relationship with God. And nothing else matters more than that. And when I find my true contentment, and I appreciate what Brandon shared in contribution today, when I find my true contentment in my relationship with God, nothing else has to matter, but he will give you a life that's worth living. He will give you everything that you need. We can't let go of that honeymoon phase with God. It's really easy. After a while, you see this in some marriages. We just saw the, the wedding of Cornell and Nishi. I don't know if a lot of you guys know who Cornell and Nishi is. They, they live in Washington, D.C. They just come back from their honeymoon uh, yesterday. But they're on their honeymoon phase, you know. And, uh, but what you see in some married couples who, who don't know how to keep communicating and being in each other's life, what happens? They get contemptuous of each other. And they get bitter at each other. And they don't know how to deal with their heart. And they just become complacent. If we get complacent in our relationship with God, indifferent. We had a great marriage devotional last night yeah. over Zoom. And, uh, and even if you're single, guys, you can still learn from marriage because in Ephesians 5, Paul, talk, Paul, a single guy, talks about marriage and how it helps him understand Christ in the church. So read Ephesians 5. You don't have to be married to appreciate Jesus in the church. Yeah. But, but we talked about whether or not I'm indifferent. It's like I'm either happy or I'm bitter, but even scarier than being bitter is indifferent when you just stop caring. And I think some of us can stop caring in our relationship with God. Maybe we didn't get what we want. We didn't deal with our heart. Maybe there's something going on in our life. we got to deal through that so we can go back to being in that honeymoon phase with God. And wherever we stand with God today, don't let it be indifferent. Be open about where you are with God, your relationship with God, and study the Bible with whoever invited you to service today to get into know God's word, to be an agent of God and not an agent of the devil. Amen? And every quiet time, and here's the powerful part, every quiet time we have, we have our own Bibles, right? And if you don't have a Bible, I'm sure you have a smartphone. Here, here's a heads up. They're called smartphones. That doesn't make you that smart. You know, I, know, I know from experience. Smartphone not make you smartphone, just like skinny jeans, amen? <laughs> but if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, you can download one. And you can get in the Word and read the Word of God every single day. We have no excuse not to get into God's word. And every devotional we have, we can just be reminded of God's grace every single day. And be on point and put on our armor knowing that Satan is coming after us with his schemes. Today, let's not be ignorant of Satan's schemes, but rather let's fight the good fight of faith. Remember, Satan's target, our mind. His weapons, our lies. His ultimate goal is to make you ignorant of God's will. And the defense that you can have is to know the truth and memorize God's word just like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To God be the glory.